About two years ago, some guy in a shed in Australia decided that making yellow tar and blowing up metal cans was no longer enough to entertain a YouTube audience. So, he decided to start making a compound with even more clickbait potential. Of course, I'm talking about Cubane. The characteristics of Cubane aren't that interesting. It's a colorless and odorless solid and, except for style points, it doesn't have that much going for it. However, the synthesis is quite interesting. There's quite a bit of variety in the types of reactions used and many of the intermediates have quite funky structures. But let's start at the beginning. The paper begins at the cyclopentanone ketal. I, however, will start one step earlier with cyclopentanone and install the ketal by myself. Ketals belong to the acetal family, which is characterized by an OCO bond with organic substituents. And especially the cyclic acetals are often used as protecting groups for carbonyls, as acetals are very resistant to base. The reaction itself is fairly simple. Under acidic conditions, cyclopentanone is protonated, forming a positive charge and undergoes a nucleophilic attack by ethylene glycol at the carbonyl carbon. The proton is then ejected and an intermediate hemiacetal is formed. The hemiacetal is again protonated at the hydroxide and eliminates water as a leaving group, followed by a fast intramolecular nucleophilic attack from the former ethylene glycol part, and after releasing a proton, the final keto product is formed with water as a byproduct. For the reaction itself, four different chemicals are needed. Toluene as a solvent, paratoluene sulfonic acid or PTSA in short as the acid catalyst, cyclopentanone and ethylene glycol. I preload a 1 liter round bottom flask with 250 milliliters of toluene, 0.5 grams of PTSA, which is pink for some reason, and a stir bar. And while I assemble the apparatus, let's talk about a little twist that this reaction has, because this particular reaction is an equilibrium reaction. This means that the reaction itself is reversible and our products can reform the educts we started with. The ratio of product to educt is determined by an equilibrium constant called K. This is also known as Le Chatelier's principle. In this kind of reaction, the constant is approximately 1, so the ratio of product to educt at the equilibrium point is about 50-50, which is bad for what we're trying to do, because the highest possible yield we could expect would be 50%. However, we can shift the equilibrium in our favor by lowering the concentration of products in the flask, because this will force more educt to convert in order to maintain the constant K. This is most commonly done by removing the water from the reaction flask. That way, more product accumulates as the educts get used up until full conversion is achieved. This is where this piece of glassware comes into action. This is called a Dean Stark apparatus, and it allows us to separate the water from the reaction by taking advantage of the fact that water and toluene form a low boiling azeotrope. When the toluene boils, it will co-distill with the water in the reaction flask, condense at the cooler and drip down into the trap. In liquid state, toluene and water are immiscible and form two phases. The water forms the lower phase and the toluene fills up the trap and drips back down into the reaction flask. This cycle will continue until no more water is deposited in the trap, indicating that the reaction is finished. The beautiful part about this is that the process runs almost autonomously and I only have to empty the trap a few times. But that's enough theory, so let's get back to the chemistry. You probably noticed that I'm running the apparatus without the reagents added. This serves the purpose of removing the water from the PTSA as it's sold as the monohydrate, which is insoluble in toluene. Now that that's done, I weigh out 127 grams of cyclopentanone and 200 grams of ethylene glycol. I'm using a double molar axis of ethylene glycol because according to this Russian paper I found, this significantly improves the yield. Both of the reagents are added to the reaction flask. A separate layer can be observed at the bottom of the flask, which looks quite nice. 
the heat is turned up to get the toluene refluxing. This will now run by itself, so i just leave you here with the thing and go make myself some dinner. Okay, I am back and this has now been refluxing for 16 hours and the water level has remained constant for the past hour. So we are done with this step. The mixture has turned a vibrant yellow color because of course it has and in total I collected 120 milliliters of water. That is a bit weird because it should only be about 27 milliliters based on the amount of cyclopentanone I used. And even if maybe the unreacted ethylene glycol forms dioxane as a side product, which also releases water, the total amount should only be 58 milliliters. So don't ask me why we have double that amount. The only explanation I could come up with is that dioxane also collects in the water layer since it's miscible and increase the volume artificially because then it comes out to around 120 milliliters. And that's probably what happened, right? Yeah, 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 probably. But let's not worry about that and just move on. I transfer the organic phase to a large separatory funnel, add all of the water from the trap and wash it twice with a saturated sodium bicarbonate solution, then a few times with distilled water and one last time with saturated sodium chloride solution. I then dry the organic phase with magnesium sulfate and I transfer it to a 1 liter round bottom flask. All that's left to do now is separate the toluene from the product via distillation. To improve separation, I install a Vigro column before the condenser. I start heating and begin collecting the first fraction, which will be mostly toluene. You can see that even with the Vigro column, the head temperature is not constant, so we have quite a bit of overlap between the fractions. This is not surprising as the boiling point difference between the ketal and toluene is only about 40 C. As the temperature reaches 120 C, I start collecting another fraction up to 130 C. The distillation is now very close to the boiling point of the ketal, so I stop heating and let the flask cool down. And in the meantime, I connect everything to my vacuum line. The distillation of the ketal will be performed under vacuum, with the cow adapter attached. This should help to squeeze out as much product as possible and prevent any possible decomposition. When pulling the vacuum and heating, the distillate starts foaming strongly, but the vigor also helps to keep the foam in the flask, so it's not an issue. At the end of the distillation, all that is left in the flask is some nice and spicy red tar. And I have collected four different fractions. Anything boiling below 40C should be mostly toluene and the fractions above 50C should contain the bulk of the product. But they are still not quite pure, so I combine fraction 3 and 4 and redistill them under vacuum, while again collecting my main fractions above 50C. All of this distillate is now pure product, and it's already a pretty decent amount. If we weigh all of this combined, we already have 118.84 grams of product, 
which is a yield of about 61.4%. The smell of the Ketel is also fairly interesting. It smells quite fruity and it sort of reminds me of a forest. But there are still a whole lot of fractions left over. There's all of the toluene I collected at the start, plus all of the vacuum fractions I discarded. But how do we find out which of these fractions still contain a relevant amount of product? Luckily this problem is very easily solved, because I can just run a TLC of all the different fractions. I also have some confirmed ketal available, to which I can compare it to, and I will also run some cyclopentanone. I take a little sample from every fraction, dilute it in acetone and then spot it on the plate. As an alliant, I use a 2 to 1 mix of hexane and ethyl acetate. Unfortunately the spots are not UV active, but they can be visualized with a vanillin stain. I dip the plate in the staining solution and dry it off and then I start heating it very gently. I'm sorry for the bad camera focus in this clip, but I had to improvise a bit as I was running out of space in my lab. The stain slowly starts appearing on the plate and we can see some nice spots developing. The plate itself is not very good sadly. It's massively overloaded, the spots are way too thick. But we can already see that there's no cyclopentano present in the product. My reference has another visible spot on it, which is probably the BHT I added as a safety measure, because acetals could potentially form peroxides. At that point I called it quits for the day and decided to redo the TLC the next day, and when I came back into the lab, I was greeted by a nice and red vanillin stain. I mean, I know vanillin sensitive to oxidation, but come on, I even stored it in a bottle. Doesn't seem to have much of an effect though, because the plate came out much better. It shows that there's still product in every fraction. I now have to distill all of the fractions again. I start with the toluene and the separation is noticeably better. I then work myself up through all of the more concentrated solutions. I did most of this off camera and I probably did a total of 8 distillations here. But look at that, I managed to get another 25 milliliters of product. There's still some impure stuff left over but I really don't want to do more distillations, so I'm happy with the amount that I have. This also shows why you should keep every fraction until the very end because it boosted the yield up to 147 grams which is a final yield of 76%. This is very close to the literature amount and I'm really happy with that. This is a pretty good start for this project and I have high hopes that I have a final yield somewhere in the two digit range. The next step will probably have to wait for a bit though, I still need to make bromine and I'll also try the reaction in absolute solvents so that's extra work I have to put in. On top of that I have a few exams coming up, but after that I can really start off. Until then, I wish you all a pleasant day and stay tuned.